All right, I've got 1301. I want to welcome everyone to this Mad Scientist event. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar, Mad Scientist is a U.S. Army initiative that continually explores the future of warfare, challenges assumptions, and collaborates with academia, industry, and government. Um, I'd like to encourage everyone to please check out our resources. We've got our blog, the Mad Scientist Laboratory. You can go there at madsciblog.tradoc.army.mil. Um, we're very active on Twitter. You can, can connect with us there at Army Mad Sci. And please subscribe to our podcast, The Convergence, available on all those fancy podcast services like iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, all those good ones. Uh, for today's event, we're looking to reach out to and listen to that younger generation, those Gen Zers who are thinking about national security challenges and solutions differently than we are. Uh, and to do that, we've once again partnered with the College of William & Mary's Project on International Peace and Security, or PIPS. Uh, we're extremely lucky to have had such a great relationship with the PIPS program for several years now, and they continue to allow us to learn from some of the best and brightest students that this nation has to offer. And today is no different. We have two fantastic panels lined up today. Uh, the first is going to focus on U.S. pacing threats, so taking a hard look at, at what Russia and China are doing. And the second is on how we can shape the future with new and novel tools. Um, before we get started, I just want to go over some quick ground rules. Uh, we want to encourage a lively and robust discussion in the chat, so please feel free to engage there. Um, I'll just ask that when you're using the chat, make sure you're sending your message to the whole group. Zoom kind of defaults to just the panelists. Uh, so when you're typing your message and you see the two line down there, just look for the drop down menu, click it and make sure it says all panelists and all attendees. That way everyone can be involved in the, dis in the discussion. So, so take a quick second to locate that feature. Uh, second, we will have a Q&A after each panel uh, directly following the presentations. So please use the Q&A function, not the chat function for your questions on the Zoom toolbar. Um, and finally, the views expressed in this event do not necessarily reflect those of the Department of Defense, Department of the Army, Army Futures Command, Training and Doctrine Command, or any other government organization. So with that out of the way, I'd like to hand it over for our first panel to the Deputy Director of Mad Scientist, Mr. Luke Shabro. Deputy Director, over to you. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. And uh, again, just honored to have uh, the PIPS fellows back. PIPS has been an uh, integral part of what Mad Scientist has done uh, in engaging with uh, youth that are actually thinking differently in a lot of these areas. And, and we've had quite a few PIPS alum that are, that are a big part of Mad Scientist uh, and some on the call today. Uh, so we're going to start off today looking at kind of our pacing threats. And I think it's extremely interesting to see the presentations that are coming forth while they're kind of disparate um, in how they are presented uh, through the lenses that, that are there. I think all of them are extremely important and tie together in a larger narrative into what the future operational environment and the strategic security environment is going to look like. Um, so I'm really excited for the next three to come up. Um, we're going to be talking to uh, Amelia Larson, Nydia Lab and Morgan Pincomb. We're going to start off uh, with Amelia Larson's presentation. Amelia is really going to be looking at the current wave of militarized Russian youth initiatives uh, and how they've been reaching out to post-Soviet youth in ways that will challenge the U.S. and its partners. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Amelia. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you to everyone for coming this afternoon. My name is Amelia Larson. I'm really pleased to be able to present my research on Russian Youth Patriotic Education Initiatives. So in the summer of 2018, an unusual summer camp was held in Zlatibor, a common tourist destination in Serbia. It was run by an odd cast of characters that included a nationalist private military company, Russian and Serbian veterans, and a Russian attache to Serbia. Teenagers from around the Balkans ran drills with guns, used knives, and practiced survival skills. It was eventually shut down by the Serbian government, citing potential child abuse. However, Zlatibor is not a one-off. It is part of a larger trend of Russian military youth education that's attempting to reshape the political attitudes of young people, both in Russia and across Eastern Europe. Since 2015, there's been a renewed focus in youth political military education programs in Russia. Building on this model, the Kremlin is exporting these patriotic militaristic programs from Russia to Eastern Europe. The goal is to make the politics of the youngest generation more pro-Russian, and this campaign threatens to undermine U.S. interests in the region. The United States can respond with legal aid to allied nations, information promotion in more neutral areas, and monitoring in firmly Russian-held zones. 
we can think of this new wave of Russian militarized youth education in concentric circles. First at the core, our programs in Russia itself. At the next circle, our programs tailored for contested regions like Crimea. The last circle is Russia's campaign across wider and Eastern Europe and abroad. The system is flexible and as we move further away from the core, Russia's programs are more sporadic and done through more proxies. Within each circle, we'll examine the nature of the problem and the most feasible US response. Patriotic military education is most pervasive, widespread and formalized within Russia, particularly in the form of UNARMIA and state and private run military related summer camps and day programs. UNARMIA caters to students aged eight to 18 and is present across virtually all Russian schools. Since it was founded by the Ministry of Defense in 2016, it has gained a reported 775,000 members, often through very aggressive recruitment tactics. Members of the military have faced pressure to enroll their children, and UNARMIA members have better chances of university admission. While it takes the form of after school groups and summer camps, UNARMIA should not be confused with ROTC or the Boy, Boy Scouts. It is militaristic and ideological, teaching young children how to use weapons, run drills, and instilling preferred conservative and neo-Soviet ideologies of the Kremlin. If successful, these programs could shape the ideology of the rising generation, transforming their politics for decades, and could also help increase sagging Russian military recruitment. Here, the United States only has so much influence. Our best course of action would be to increase monitoring to best understand the true nature of this threat. In the second circle are the contested zones and breakaway regions. In South Ossetia and Abkhazia, Transnistria, Crimea, and the Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts, UNARMIA is a model for parallel programs and aligned actors. The Kremlin uses a variety of tools here. First, UNARMIA directly inducts foreign youth from South Ossetia, Transnistria, and Crimea in significant numbers. Second, UNARMIA also opens chapters abroad for the children of Russian embassy and military personnel, creating the basis for summer camps and parks that also serve local youth. Third, Russia fosters parallel organizations like Young Guard UNARMIA and Donetsk and Luhansk, which mimic UNARMIA in name, activities, ideology, and even uniforms. Finally, Russia coordinates with aligned actors like Cossack formations and nationalist groups to permeate education systems. Here, these youth military programs could dovetail with existing efforts to influence local populations and increase Russian control of these territories, undermining the United States who does not recognize these claims. The United States has limited influence here as well, but not none. And the United States can publicize unflattering information about these programs in an effort to dissuade locals from letting their children attend. The strategy would use existing cynicism about Russia for US interests. In the outer ring, further abroad, the Kremlin deploys allied groups like the Orthodox Church, nationalist groups, cycle gangs, and veterans organizations on its behalf. In this circle, the campaign takes several forms. First, the Kremlin and its proxy actors have hosted sporadic summer camps abroad, like the one in Serbia. Secondly, summer camps and competitions within Russia recruit participants from abroad, particularly from the near abroad and contested territories. Thirdly, UNARMIA detachments at Russian embassies engage in outreach to local communities and in charity projects, particularly ones that are politically targeted. Finally, UNARMIA engages in partnerships with local youth groups with similar values abroad. These further outreach efforts are flexible, navigating through more and less friendly governments. They rely on conservative beliefs, shared religious values, and Soviet nostalgia to reach out to these children and to their parents. From these common ideas, they seek to introduce children to more militaristic Russian worldviews. The current campaign serves as a foundation for potential expansion of Russian soft power in the region, hoping to influence highly impressionable children to their benefit. Here, the United States has more options to respond. Latvia, which struggled with its children crossing the border for military education summer camps in Russia in the past, responded in recent years with legislation explicitly prohibiting participation. The United States could support willing partners in drafting similar laws to help clamp down on youth participation in these initiatives. The Russian government's efforts to influence young people are serious, concerted, and coordinated. We may not know for many years what the exact effects will be, but the potential threat to the rising generation and the security of US partners is clear. The United States has several options to respond, 
and must work with locals to push back against this rising tide of Russian militarized youth education. Thank you. That was fantastic, Amelia, and I think a lot to think about, uh, especially as it pertains to future operational environments. So I'm sure we're going to have a lot of questions uh, moving forward. So next, we're actually going to have uh, Nidia Lab, who's class of 2022. Uh, and Nidia is going to be kind of talking to us about the effects of sea level rise on a lot of these small island countries and that how, how that presents an opportunity for the CCP or the Chinese Communist Party to conduct island building and land reclamation uh, in the Southwestern Pacific. So really excited to hear from Nydia and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'm really excited to do my research today. Many people are aware of China's construction of artificial islands in the South China Sea. This project takes from that idea and argues that China will export its island building capabilities around the world namely in the Southwest Pacific. The Pacific Island Countries, or PICs, are a series of 15 states spread across the Southwest Pacific. They include Fiji, Kiribati, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, the Solomon Islands, and Tuvalu. PICs face a near-term existential threat from climate change. These island countries are already the most vulnerable region in the world to sea level rise, flooding, and wave inundation. Eight islands have already disappeared, and by 2050, 48 other islands are expected to follow. Migration is not an option for Pacific Island countries. PICs have an average elevation of two meters above sea level. This means more often than not, there's no higher ground to move to. There's also a cultural significance and relationship between the people and their land. This means on islands where there is higher ground, migration is unpopular and difficult. In addition, migrating out of their countries or towns creates a major issue of sovereignty for island states. Overall, migration is expensive, and there are a lot of bureaucratic challenges that prevent it from taking place. In addition, Pacific Island countries' political allegiances rely on climate action. A lack of climate action from traditional partners like the US and Australia has been received as a personal affront to the PICS. For example, after the US withdrew from the Paris Climate Accord, the director of Tuvalu's environmental ministry said, I think they hate us. Instead, Pacific Islands are looking to China for climate assistance. According to the president of Kiribati, China is just more serious about the Paris Accords. China also recognizes that its ability to act on climate change for the Pacific Islands is critical to its regional influence. In response to the climate needs of these islands, China can offer its land reclamation services. China has a comparative advantage in land reclamation, conducting one third of all global reclamation projects in Shanghai alone. China also has the world's largest dredging fleet and continues to invest billions in these capabilities. China has also exported its land reclamation capabilities abroad, conducting projects in Sri Lanka, Cambodia, and Malaysia. Land reclamation is expensive, and that gives China economic leverage to build influence in the Pacific Island countries where it conducts these projects. China can exercise this type of economic leverage through corruption and restrictive lending practices. Pacific Islands already struggle with debt. In fact, Tonga, Samoa, and Vanuatu are some of the most indebted countries to China in the world. Chinese land reclamation will therefore create conditions for serious debt sustainability problems in the future. With this type of leverage and expansionism, China can limit US power projection in the first and second island chain. By increasing their influence in the Pacific Islands, China can build power projection capabilities in the region to gain support for Beijing's political agenda among Pacific Island leaders. This influence and expansion would allow the PRC to threaten US and ally sea lanes of communication across the region and creates a contested space in the Southwest Pacific. Currently, US policies aren't designed to address this type of threat. US aid is centered around capacity building, not climate infrastructure. The US lacks credibility on climate commitments in the region. And lastly, the US has compacts of free association with Palau, Micronesia, and the Marshall Islands. These compacts include defense agreements, which give the US authority over all land, water, and airspace for security and defense matters in these countries. The US also has the authority to prevent developments in these countries that represent a security threat. However, a lack of situational awareness in the Pacific Islands mean US policymakers haven't always used COFA authority to prevent Chinese expansionism. In response, the United States should consider highlighting and limiting problematic Chinese activity in the region. This begins with regional monitoring and intelligence gathering. The US could collaborate with its regional allies and PICs to share information and awareness about China's problematic activities. The US could engage in public diplomacy campaigns that increase international scrutiny towards China's influence in the region as well. 
Monitoring would allow the U.S. to provide effective legal assistance to PICs in land reclamation contract negotiations with China. Increased regional awareness also allows the United States to better engage in the upcoming COFA renegotiations to reinforce its commitment to the region. Altogether, these measures limit avenues for China to gain influence in the Pacific Islands. Second, the United States should consider offering alternatives to Chinese land reclamation in the region. The United States can offer its own land reclamation projects to Pacific Island countries. This would require expanding the U.S. dredging capacity both at home and abroad. The United States can collaborate with regional development partners like Australia, Japan, and Taiwan to create a multilateral lending compact to finance these land reclamation projects. By working with allies and partners in this lending program, the U.S. can offer an effective counter response to China's Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, through which the PRC also builds influence in the Pacific. In addition, the United States could act as a guarantor for alternative land reclamation contracts. Contract guarantees help build investor confidence to encourage increased private sector participation. Lastly, U.S. construction already follows higher environmental and infrastructural standards. U.S. land reclamation in the region would create minimum standards for all island building against which China would have to compete. Ultimately, the ability of the U.S. to respond to this type of threat requires it to operate along a continuum of competition, addressing both the climate needs of the Pacific Island states and regional security concerns. As Beijing leverages land reclamation to challenge the legitimacy and presence of the U.S. in the Pacific, policymakers must consider strategies that limit Chinese influence and create new options for Pacific Island states. Thank you. Nydia, that was fantastic. And that is why we bring you all in um, to provide these perspectives. And, and I really think it was just excellent. Um, so we're going to transition next uh, to Mor uh, Morgan Pincombe, who's looking at uh, the mirroring of unequal treaties uh, in China's century of humiliation. So how does China turn around and impose unequal contracts in these other areas? Uh, and I think um, when it comes to the E portion of dime, uh, this is a, a particularly fascinating aspect. Uh, so over to you, Morgan. Thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you for having us here today. I'm really excited to share my research on the Gulf of Guinea. At the height of China's century of humiliation, Prince Gong of China protested Western imperialism saying, quote, the barbarians take advantage of our weak position and try to control us, end quote. Today, China is signing unequal contracts for fishing access and ports in the Gulf of Guinea, the body of water bordering the 20 coastal countries of West and Central Africa from Mauritania to Angola. China is capitalizing on Gulf of Guinea countries weak bargaining power and enforcement capabilities, leading to resource exploitation, illegal fishing, and the potential for Chinese power projection. These unequal contracts create an opportunity for the United States to address China's neocolonialism and mitigate humanitarian risks. Beijing relied on improving its international legal capacity, a method it called self-strengthening, when combating the unequal treaties of Western imperialism between 1839 and 1949. United States can use China's historical tactics against it by providing legal support to Gulf of Guinea countries negotiating with China. China is carrying out a series of land and maritime investments through its Belt and Road Initiative, seeking to reestablish the global commercial dominance it lost during the century of humiliation. Although these BRI projects provide critical infrastructure and economic growth for partner countries, BRI projects pose three significant risks. First, African BRI partners often take on unsustainable and inflated debt. Second, this unsustainable debt can give China increasing economic and political leverage over BRI partners. Third, China's approach to development fuels corruption by financially and politically rewarding senior African leaders. Despite these risks, the majority of Africans perceive China as a positive development partner, especially due to their common history of colonization by the West. Chinese leaders promote the BRI as a win-win development blueprint built on sincere friendship, unity, and cooperation. China has expanded its distant water fishing industry through the BRI in order to service increasing demand for fish and fish meal. Chinese companies offer development finance and infrastructure in line with the BRI spirit in exchange for access to West and Central African fishing grounds where the second and third most productive marine ecosystems in the world are found. However, China ranks as the worst offender of illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. The Chinese fleet underreports its catch and fleet size and catches around 40% of its fish illegally. As a facet of its distant water fishing industry, port construction, especially in West Africa, has also been a priority of the BRI. The Gulf of Guinea hosts many Chinese-supported ports, 
and some of China's fishing bases, which include fishing ports, processing plants, and logistics facilities. Gulf of Guinea countries partner with China because fishing access provides critical revenue and ports improve trade. However, deficient regulation, weak enforcement, and corruption make Gulf of Guinea countries particularly susceptible to exploitative fishing practices. IUU fishing and overfishing leads to an annual loss of revenue for West Africa of between $1.3 and $2.3 billion. Contradicting China's rhetoric about mutually beneficial cooperation, China compensates Gulf of Guinea countries only 4% of the value of the fish it extracts. Chinese port investments are also often overvalued and entail unfavorable lending terms. Through these unequal contracts, China is imposing a century of humiliation on Gulf of Guinea countries. Addressing China's neocolonialism in the Gulf of Guinea presents the United States with three opportunities. First, the United States can mitigate economic and social destabilization in an already fragile region by combating the exploitation of marine resources in the Gulf of Guinea. The majority of the fish in the Gulf of Guinea are threatened nearly to extinction. Depleted fish stocks heighten the risk of employment and food insecurity in the region, with many depending on fish for their food and livelihoods. Second, the United States can manage the expansion of China's political influence in the region by shaping Gulf of Guinea countries' participation in the BRI. The proliferation of dual-use ports and the strengthening of a loyal support base among African leaders positions China to extend its power projection in the future. Finally, developing a legal cooperation intervention in Gulf of Guinea fisheries would provide a low-cost, low-risk proof of concept that could be used as a model to counter Chinese neocolonialism in more strategic, higher-cost regions and industries. The United States can adopt China's own method of self-strengthening from its century of humiliation to help partners in the Gulf of Guinea overcome China's exploitation. Viable partners for this legal intervention can initially be selected based on countries' low corruption and high transparency ratings to improve the success of this intervention. In addition, the United States can conduct local public relations campaigns that garner support for legal coordination and improve the outcomes of negotiations. The United States can bring China to the negotiating table by employing the rhetoric of the century of humiliation. Conducting technical assessments will inform legal bodies of the value of maritime resources in the Gulf of Guinea, which is crucial for contract negotiations. During negotiations, legal advisors can focus on shaping contract terms, including pushing for transparency, imposing landing clauses, regulating transshipments, and encouraging payment in tangible assets. After the negotiation, ongoing legal capacity initiatives will help Gulf of Guinea countries effectively enforce contracts and manage resources. U.S. legal cooperation with Gulf of Guinea countries is a model for fighting Chinese predatory practices globally. After developing legal cooperation interventions in Gulf of Guinea fisheries, the United States can apply this model in other key regions, resource sectors, and infrastructure projects. Addressing the weak negotiating power of low and middle income countries combats exploitative neocolonial development practices. U.S. legal cooperation could help prevent further destabilization in an already, in an already fragile region while also enabling Gulf of Guinea countries and the United States to capture the greatest benefit from Chinese development investment. Thank you. Excellent. Once again, Morgan, and uh, I think again, a critical, excuse me, a critical aspect uh, of how we think about competition as well in these regions. So we're going to go ahead and open up to some questions. Uh, I want to start with a question from someone mad scientists a little familiar with, uh, Marie Murphy, um, asking Amelia, in the broader outreach, uh, do you see a connection between export of Russian military ideology and the export of Russian cultural ideology, name, uh, namely religion? Uh, do these camps represent cultural religious indoctrination in addition to that military training? Awesome. Thank you so much for that wonderful question. I just want to start off by saying that I'm a bit familiar with Marie's work as well, and I would encourage anyone who's more broadly interested in the role of uh, religion in the military in Russia uh, to check out Marie's very excellent um, white paper from a couple of years ago, which was very helpful to me. Um, just to sort of mention, religion absolutely plays a role in how this is exported. Uh, I can mention a couple sort of different ways that that emerges. Um, first of all, there have been some, some reports that uh, Russian Orthodox Church branches, such as the one in Belarus, have played a role in recruiting uh, youth to participate in summer camps in Russia, for instance, so playing a role in, in doing that sort of outreach. Um, second, you often see these camps, summer camps being named after um, of figures from the Russian Orthodox Church and having figures from uh, officials from the Russian Orthodox Church coming to speak to children as well. Uh, and lastly, 
the, the fact that a Russian Orthodox priest of some sort is almost always present at any Unarmia or uh, Young Guard Unarmia induction. So it's, it's a constant presence. Um, and sort of the, the role I think that plays though, uh, is there's to some extent probably some reinforcing of that value in the way that it's connected to the Russian military and the idea of the Russian world more broadly. Um, but I think also one of the, the things that's particularly the example in Belarus points out is that it's a way to reach out to kids. So the fact that the Russian Orthodox Church is present across many of the countries Russia would like to reach out to already um, provides it a, a useful tool to export other things through that channel, uh, whether that be by reaching out um, uh, to uh, youth through that common value or pitching it in a way that contrasts the Russian Orthodox Church with sort of the West and the values that it might have. Um, and sort of increasing support for other things, including including the Russian state, including uh, the Kremlin's foreign policy through that avenue. So thank you so much for that excellent question. So I think you answered a little extension of what I would have for that question, Amelia, which is, you know, uh, Russia historically has used um, the fact that there's there's Russian speakers in certain territories to as part, a larger part of their claim um, to be able to take action in those areas, um, even though they'll still deny the actions of, of little green men um, in those areas. So do you see that as an extension as well um, in terms of, and, and maybe this is getting more into Marie's lane originally, um, but the idea of, of the religious extension out there of using, uh, protecting the, those Russian Orthodox. No, absolutely. I, I think the, the sort of language thing is definitely um, uh, an aspect to this as well. Uh, one thing that I found very interesting in my research is a couple of people I spoke to said about Russian um, sort of youth programs, the idea that um, it may be that if you don't speak English, you're not able to go to an international competition or camp or something in Europe, but you might be able to go to one in Russia if you speak Russia. So at the very basic level, practically, it does provide a way to reach out. Um, and with the sort of like cultural overtones that Russia attaches to it, um, creates that justification as well that you as a Russian speaker, you as someone, uh, as a member of the Russian Orthodox Church are part of this wider um, Russian sphere of influence and this Russian world. And that really does it. The, this, uh, these sort of youth programs do very much occupy that same space of being part of this wider uh, umbrella where Russia claims to, to have the interests of people beyond its border at heart. Um, and I think it does fit very neatly with those ideas. So thank you. Another question um, that we have, uh, could the indoctrination of this generation of Russian ethnic youth uh, create future pockets of destabilization on the edge of NATO, so in, in the Baltics? And you kind of talked again um, in, into that kind of uh, Russian Orthodox and, and everything else, but do you see this as pushing out into those areas? Uh, I think definitely it is a tool that could be expanded further in the future. You sort of see um, outreach strongly to, to areas like Serbia right now, um, to these contested regions, uh, but those sort of like additional um, threads of influence going out uh, through the sort of wider range of influence by bringing kids to participate in summer camps in Russia, by holding sporadic summer camps abroad that do reach out to sort of areas that Russia may be interested in having people on its side in the future. Um, your Belaruses, um, your, uh, your Moldovas and whatnot. Um, I, I'm looking forward to like doing more research in the future about the specific ways it could target that, but absolutely the sort of tools that they have and the sort of infrastructure that's being set up is, uh, allows for more expansion in the future. Thank you. Absolutely. And then uh, I'll, I'll do one more question for you before we move on. Um, one of the questions is, um, do you see evidence at all that Russia is using where uh, we see kind of in US media, um, where, where Russia has been trying to, uh, in, in China to lesser extent, um, trying to exploit cultural and societal fractures uh, within the United States and um, taking movements that, that we've seen uh, between social and, and civil movements. And then um, are they then using that comparatively to that, that Russian patriotism aspect to say, look at, look at what we do um, and, and how united we are uh, behind our country as compared to, do you want the, the discord and chaos that you see in the United States? Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for that question. Obviously a, a very relevant um, topic. Uh, 
I think that it is absolutely true that that contrast is very important in the way that these um, youth programs are pitched and the sort of things that you learn once you get to one of them. Um, one of the experts that we talked to in our research uh, talked about the fact that in some cases a contrast may be set up where it's not either your kid goes to UNARMIA or they do something else with their summer, but rather your kid is going to be raised by UNARMIA and the sort of values of the Russian state or your kid is going to be raised by religious and political radicals in the LGBT community. Um, and so absolutely see sort of a contrast being set up between two things where, where Russia with its values is on one side um, and things that it and parents of children who participate in UNARMIA might theoretically be opposed to. Um, I think I, I have not yet seen an example where there's a specific instance taken from the US politically and used to contrast, but I, I don't think that that's necessarily meaning that it's not out there or that it's impossible, um, especially because more broadly in these programs, you sort of see a contrast between a, a Russian vision of the world and of the state um, with uh, the West. And you see an emphasis on personal sacrifice um, for the state and things like that. Uh, but generally what I've seen so far is more straw men um, the contrast is, is generally between this kind of program and some, some neo-fascist enemy or this kind of program um, and a, a radical protester who is trying to simply use their protest to undermine the government in some ways. Um, so definitely a, a possibility and contrast is in, incredibly inherently important, but that's not a specific example I've seen yet. Um, I'll definitely be on the lookout for it though. No, thank you, Amelia. That's excellent. And so uh, moving on to a question with Nydia um, from the audience, do you think that the climate changes uh, in regard to Pacific Island nations are actually a good opportunity for the U.S. to collaborate with other partners and allies in the region, uh, like a Japan or Singapore, or even a Taiwan, uh, to show kind of this more combined approach uh, to the Chinese encroachments in this area? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, I think that this is definitely an opportunity where not only can we look to our allies, but we should look to our allies. Um, cooperation with regional allies is key to countering growing Chinese influence in the Pacific. When it comes to our ability to identify threats and monitor this region, allies can help supplement that type of surveillance capabilities or that monitoring. Um, allies also have a greater relationship with a lot of these countries, whether it's Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Taiwan, they're a lot closer to this. And so they can help us in terms of building relationships and engaging with the region. And when it comes to competitive island building um, and offering our own capabilities, Taiwan and Japan have great dredging capabilities that they already employ. And they also have extreme amounts of multilateral financing that they already send to this region. So leaning on both their finances and their capabilities can help us compete with China in a way that's not only efficient for us, but that is really playing to our strengths. Sorry, trying to mute there. Uh, thank you so much for, for that expansive answer. And then also, um, when, when you talked about some of the solutions, and if you could just reiterate a couple of those before before answering this, but um, when you talked about those solutions, can they be seen potentially as escalatory to China? So um, right now we, we have this presence within the South China Sea um, when it comes to the island chains and the freedom of navigation um, that we see taking place from the United States Navy um, that was happening even back when I, when I was a sailor back in the day in 2005 and 2007. Um, but can these, these other solutions be seen as escalatory um, in this competition space? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. I think it's important to understand the difference between competing and moving towards conflict with China versus coexisting and managing threats in the region. So when it comes to the idea of competitive island building per se, um, I think it's, it's great for the US to set standards on practice. And so the idea of competitive island building is more about letting sovereign Pacific Island states have more options when it comes to land reclamation services. And so if we can provide more sustainable and more financially equitable options in terms of island building, China will also have to live up to those standards. And so it's not about preventing China from engaging with the region as much as it's about managing the ways in which they do so that we can prevent any type of escalation. Um, and then when it comes to regional monitoring, I think 
it's more about our ability to engage on climate and build credibility with these countries. So it's not so much about pushing China out, which, which won't work with the Pacific Islands, as much as it's about building our own, our own diplomatic channels in that region. I, I think that makes a lot of sense in terms of emphasis on diplomacy um, and, and how we get to that effort uh, rather than, than focused on um, the other more competitive aspects. Um, although I do know China, China tends to perceive those things uh, or can find a way to perceive those things uh, as competition or aggressive regardless. Um, what, what kind of investment by the United States do you think is necessary in order to, to start making those U.S. Uh, land uh, reclamation services competitive with those of China? What do we have to do, um, not only in terms of you know, GDP dollars, um, but in terms of effort and focus and, and maybe even um, di diversion of attention to that area? I think this one's a little harder in terms of the numbers. Land reclamation is expensive. But what we do have, as I mentioned earlier, is our allies to lean on in the region. Japan, for example, has proposed land reclamation projects in the Pacific Islands. And while those were later shelved, we know that Japan and Taiwan both have great dredging capabilities that they can volunteer abroad. And so as much as it's about US investment, we can lean on ally multilateral aid and capabilities to begin some of these projects in the region. When it comes to US capabilities, we are already going to have to start investing in our own dredging capabilities as we look to address sea level rise at home. The US is a Pacific nation when it comes to our West Coast. And so building up our own dredging capabilities, knowing that that's a capability we'll need for ourselves, and then practicing and building up those capabilities by extending island building abroad, I think is a great way to prepare ourselves for our own future. So it's a little bit of the allies and a little bit of our own investment. Absolutely. And I think um, I'm going to ask you a question that, that can be kind of difficult. Um, so feel free to give me the, just the best answer you can. Um, if I gave you number one budget priority right now when it came to uh, the Indo-PACOM region um, and, and you can spend whatever you need to spend in order to uh, deter or, or deny kind of China in this area, what is the first thing that you would focus on? I think within the scope of the Southwest Pacific and the Pacific Islands, the number one thing to spend on is engagement and diplomacy and development, if, if you can kind of encompass all of that together. So regardless of whether it's island building, which will be a, a new, I think, strategic lever for China, I think there's a lot of other ways that China is able to build influence on all these countries across the Pacific. And that's how they challenge US power projection and US presence. So if we're trying to reinforce our position in the Indo-Pacific, it's all about challenging those levers of influence. And our best and most direct way to do that is through diplomacy and development and effectively engaging with these countries when it comes to infrastructure investment, which is something we really lack on when it comes to aid. Absolutely. Fantastic answer. Thank you. Uh, thank you for all that, Nydia. It, it's been absolutely uh, incredible uh, what you've brought to the table for this. We're going to transition to some questions with Morgan now. Um, Morgan, one of the questions is, how can the United States legitimately criticize uh, China's neo-colonial practices um, without necessarily seeming hypocritical, uh, given, given some of our own activity in the Asia-Pacific region? Sure, thank you for that question. Um, I think it's important to, to clarify that we are pointing out neocolonialism and specifically relying on this historical parallel in order to draw a likeness between something that is culturally significant in China, um, which is their experience of exploitation during their century of humiliation. Um, and using that to point out the differences or the similarities between their historical experience and their current practices and the differences between their current practices and the, the current practice and stance of the US for equitable partnerships. Um, so the way that the US is engaging um, and can engage with the Gulf of Guinea region through these type of legal coordination negotiation interventions um, by involving itself to, to bolster the negotiating power of these weaker countries, um, it would be manifesting and demonstrating its commitment to equity, which would be a contrast to um, China's own current practices in the region. No, absolutely. Thank you for, for the um, ability to, to do the comparative analysis there. 
Um, the United States is increasingly trying to cooperate with China on certain issues like, like climate change. Um, how does your solution kind of balance the U.S. desire to both cooperate with China, um, but on the other end, we still have to try and counter uh, Chinese influence in, in competition? Sure, yeah, thanks. Um, I think this strategy for U.S. engagement in the region comes at a recognition that other approaches are insignificant um, and, and ineffective in approaching the issue, such as we cannot rely on outspending China in the region. Um, we cannot rely on the failure of the BRI um, financially. It, it is not going, it's not guaranteed to fail um, in Africa. So it's important to be proactive. And then the US also um, cannot discourage partnerships. African countries, despite growing discontent, are continuing to partner with China. So it's important to find a strategy of engagement um, in this region and to counter China um, in a way that allows the US to provoke China by using this century of humiliation rhetoric um, to say, hey, come to the negotiating table. Um, and we recognize that the current strategy of engagement in this region is exploiting these countries and taking advantage of their weaker negotiating power, but also showing China it's not that the US is trying to discourage partnerships. It's not trying to undermine the BRI. It's saying we recognize that there is opportunities for investment um, that we would like to help these countries secure. We're willing to work with you, um, but putting constraints on what those partnerships can look like. That kind of, um, I, I think that's a really important piece. And it actually ties back to something we talked about this past summer in weaponization and information, uh, where Dr. Ajit uh, Mon uh, spoke. Uh, she's, a, she's a professor of uh, future warfare at uh, Arizona State University. And one of the things she talks about with narrative warfare is the idea that you can't just have counter narrative. You can't just um, try and undermine the message, but rather you have to have your own narrative um, to, to fit into that. And I think your point is, is exactly right there um, and that we have to show what we offer and how it fits into the larger context. Um, so I, I think that's a, a fantastic um, idea. And so um, I want to ask, sorry, one more question here. Um, I, I think this is a good segue to why should the United States care? Um, and, and we think about fishing in Guinea, right? And, and pun intended, you know, some might say we have bigger fish to fry um, when it comes to China and the threats that we're facing um, and where we have to counter cross. So why should we care about some of these other nations and in, in areas that maybe some people would not consider strategically important? Sure, and I appreciate the fish pun. There is certainly no shortage of fish puns. Um, I've had my fun over the past year using them. <laughs> Um, certainly. So I think for three reasons the U.S. should care. First being that these humanitarian issues are um, important in maintaining the stability and preventing further destabilization in this region because the large role um, that fish play in food and employment insecurity, um, because of that role, the United States needs to care about the way that the decline of fish stocks is impacting these regions and the way that humanitarian conditions declining um, would put this region at risk in the future and potentially require further US engagement and intervention in the future. Um, second, China is laying the groundwork to extend, extend its political influence in the region in the future, um, both through dual use ports, which it is increasingly operating in the region. Um, and with that, you know, unsustainable debt, um, it risks having more and more leverage and potentially also having more military presence in the region. Um, politically, it's aligning itself closer with African leaders, which means that on the international stage, um, African countries are increasingly voting more in line with China. And that um, is a reason that the United States should care about the way that these countries align itself between the US and China. Um, and third, I think the very reason that, or the very fact that the Gulf of Guinea is not a highly strategic, high cost, high risk region is a great way um, and a great reason why the United States should try to like, pilot this intervention in this region. Um, it's a great way to troubleshoot. It's a great way to proof of concept, um, develop evidence of effectiveness before then deploying it in other regions and industries um, around the world where it is at a higher cost and higher risk to the United States. Um, and it should not be the first run. So the Gulf of Guinea provides that kind of training ground um, in order to demonstrate that this kind of intervention can work um, and developing strategies to make it effective in other areas as well. 
I love that answer. Thank you. And, and to be clear, I'm playing devil's advocate. I don't believe they're unimportant. Um, I'll blame that on Matt Sansfer since he's muted and uh, his video is off right now. Um, so I'm going to ask one more question uh, similar to, to what I asked with Nydia. Um, and this is just one I'm really curious about. Um, so I make uh, Morgan Secretary of State for the day. Um, you get to decide in, in this diplomatic arena, uh, what are we going to do? Um, what's your first action? What are you doing? Sure. I think, first of all, if you have that power, please bestow it on me. I would love to be Secretary of State for a day. Um, second, I think if I had that power and chose to start um, in developing this project, we recognize the role of corruption and how it's important to mitigate corruption within um, the development of this intervention and throughout the negotiations in order to have the highest impact. So I think I would start um, by trying to implement this intervention in a country with low corruption and high transparency ratings, because I think that would be of the highest success. So in looking at those different criteria, um, the countries that we identified in the region were Senegal, Sao Tome and Principe um, and Cape Verde. So I think I would strike up diplomatic relations and try to begin the process of implementing this intervention in those countries, um, both because it has the highest um, potential for success due to their pre-existing criteria and also because by doing it in those environments, we could then generate the kind of um, evidence and strategy building to then deploy in other, um, within the region, countries that have higher corruption ratings, but then also go global. Fantastic. And I, I will, uh, I will get talking to uh, President Biden about that and getting you those powers ASAP. Um, I, honestly, um, all of you have given me such fantastic answers. In addition to the incredible information from your presentations, I'm super grateful. Uh, this is why I get extremely uh, angry and frustrated when I hear people criticize uh, the next generation. Uh, we get to see it on display all the time with mad scientists, and that's why we want to display here. Gen Z, you guys are bringing the absolute um, best ideas, policies, um, and insights into the future um, without, uh, thankfully, the jaded class as of the rest of us. Thank you, uh, all three of you. You did phenomenal. Um, and we can't thank you enough for, for coming in. Uh, so I'm going to, at this time, pivot over to Matt Sanisbert, um, who, who will kind of uh, introduce us next into uh, the next panel. All right. Thanks, Luke. And hey, talk about starting out with a bang. Um, good. My, my gosh, that was fantastic. That was a, a very comprehensive look at some of the challenges uh, we're going to face in the future from our pacing threats. Um, you know, we had everything, like they said, from from uh, fishing to climate change to contract. It was it was it was awesome. We even had a good pun, uh, an, an OK pun. Um, so that was great. So um, we're going to take a five minute break here. I have 148 on the clock. So let's come back at 153 as we virtually shuffle people off the stage and back on and we will get started with the second panel. So back in five minutes. All right, I got 153 here. I hope everyone enjoyed their break. They were able to freshen their drink up, hit the bathroom and refresh. Um, I wanna thank everybody from the first panel. Absolutely awesome job. We're now gonna to jump to the second panel here where Miss uh, Caroline Duckworth will be our moderator. So Caroline, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Matt, uh, and welcome back, everyone. I'm so excited to be a part of this event. You know, as a former PIPS fellow and as a current Mad Scientist team member, um, I'm really getting to combine my favorite things, and I, I'm so excited to hear what our next three panelists have to have to tell us. Um, so as a reminder, if you have questions for these uh, upcoming presentations, uh, submit them using the Q&A function in your chat bar. Um, so first, we will hear from Lauren Boyce, class of 2022, on the use of GIS as a tool to relocate climate migrants. So Lauren, take it away. All right, thank you so much for having me and the opportunity to share my research with you all today. Three times as many people were displaced by climate change in 2019 as were displaced by conflict or violence that same year. This displacement will only accelerate. The United States has an opportunity to mitigate the destabilizing effects of climate displacement by partnering with low and middle income countries to relocate vulnerable communities. Climate change is expected to displace between 150 and 300 million people by 2050, with at least 140 million people being displaced internally. 
climate change will disproportionately affect poor agricultural communities whose livelihoods depend on the climate. To make it worse, the most vulnerable communities are in countries with high levels of social instability. Seven of the top 10 countries at extreme risk for climate change already host United Nations peacekeeping missions. Current trends are a sign of what's to come. As rural livelihoods are threatened, more communities will migrate toward urban centers. Climate displacement is expected to swell some populations by 700 million people over the next 10 years, forcing groups to vie for increasingly scarce resources. The International Committee of the Red Cross estimates that 96% of all future urban growth will occur in cities at a high risk for violent conflict. But this scenario does not have to become a reality. In February, President Biden issued an executive order calling for strategies to protect and resettle individuals displaced by climate change. He also encouraged collaboration with other countries in response to this migration. The United States is looking for opportunities to assert itself as a leader on climate migration and displacement. Relocation assistance partnerships are the opportunity that we've been looking for. Now, relocation is exactly what it sounds like, an organized process where groups are resettled and given the resources needed to rebuild their livelihoods. The international community has already begun to perceive relocation as an important adaptation strategy. In creating frameworks for planned relocation, they identified four characteristics to define the suitability of potential relocation sites, low environmental risk, allowing for the continuation of agricultural livelihoods, having adequate infrastructure and access to services, and compatibility with the cultural needs of the relocated community. But knowing what to look for is one thing. Knowing how to look for and identify these characteristics is a conversation that has yet to be had. This is where geospatial technology comes in. Geographic information systems can use any location-based data to display patterns that would otherwise be difficult to visualize. This analysis will be incredibly helpful when planning relocations. Assessments of climate conditions, estimates of agricultural productivity, and maps of infrastructure can all be produced using GIS analysis and remote sensing data. Relocation assistance partnerships can marry more quantitative data with local knowledge about culture and ethnic divisions to best cater relocation sites to the needs of the communities involved. The Sundarbans in West Bengal, India have a high risk of climate displacement and are an ideal candidate for relocation assistance. Using a geospatial process called a suitability analysis, we can identify regions with similar or better agricultural conditions than the Sundarbans and locate potentially suitable relocation sites. For this model, I've chosen to focus on the continuation of livelihoods through rice production. By layering elevation, slope, land cover, precipitation, and nutrient availability, you can see that similar and even higher levels of suitability for rice production shown here in dark green are found northwest of the Sundarbans and in the northernmost region of West Bengal. Further models for this case should focus on infrastructure, access to services, future climate risk, dominant social cleavages, and population density within these regions. This relocation analysis requires collaboration. Partnerships will bring together local data and American expertise in geospatial technology ensuring that relocation planning incorporates all essential perspectives and variables. Relocation assistance initiatives should focus on three objectives. First, community input. Local communities provide essential cultural knowledge that when married with American geospatial expertise can create comprehensive and sustainable data-driven solutions. Second, developing local human capital. Training programs can be a significant financial burden on low and middle income countries. The United States can ease this burden by training local partners until they're able to independently plan future relocations. And finally, partnerships can impart norms regarding ethical data analysis and the treatment of vulnerable populations. For data analysis, it's imperative to avoid introducing bias into the model, 
such as favoring land owned by decision makers. Further, relocation should not unjustly target, afford a worse standard of living, or give fewer rights to climate displaced populations than to other groups. The international community needs a leader on climate resilience. The United States can be that leader by partnering with low and middle income countries relocation can become one of the most effective strategies for combating climate displacement. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren, for that presentation. As a student at William & Mary, I took so many GIS classes, so your project's of particular interest to me, um, and I was so excited to hear, hear your ideas. Um, up next, we'll hear from Sonia Shahid, class of 2022, on her project on the opportunities in the world of online piracy. Sonia, go ahead. Thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you all so much for attending. I'm pleased to be sharing my research on messaging opportunities through digital piracy networks. Belarus is among the world's worst countries in political and social media censorship. It is also one of the largest markets for digital piracy per internet user. Piracy is the unlicensed distribution and consumption of copyrighted movies and television shows. Pirated materials are distributed through peer-to-peer -peer websites and downloading channels. So far, most analysis of piracy is focused on how to stop piracy. And in this focus, we failed to notice it as an opportunity. Piracy is inevitable. Content on these sites is easy to manipulate, available on unregulated or underregulated sectors of the internet, and incredibly engaging. Most importantly, audiences that engage in piracy are ones that civil society organizations have failed to reach through alternative platforms. The financial motives of distributing pirated material are clear. Piracy is immensely profitable. The first way that digital pirates make money is by selling advertisements on their websites, either through larger advertising networks like Google AdSense or direct deals with companies. Secondly, piracy websites offer memberships to their users. These memberships provide benefits such as advertisement-free viewing and have roped in roughly 9 million broadband subscribers in just the US. Pirates also make money by mining Bitcoins. Bitcoin is a type of crypt cryptocurrency that must be digitally mined, which requires a computer's processing power. Pirates get this power by hacking their users' operating systems and downloading cryptocurrency mining malware. Consumers on pirated media differ from regular consumers along lines of region and age. Low and middle income countries like Georgia, Ukraine, and Belarus rank among the highest in per internet user consumption of pirated films and television shows. Younger age groups, usually individuals between 18 to 24 years, are more likely to participate, with older users becoming more common as piracy is normalized. A variety of factors lead individuals to visit piracy websites. First, paywalls. Streaming and downloading pirated mate material allows individuals to avoid paywalls. Even when consumers have bought subscription services, many popular titles require additional subscriptions or can only be viewed at extra cost. Second, region locks. Most over-the-top streaming services like HBO and Hulu are not available beyond the United States and Europe. Third, censorship. Streaming services like Netflix and Amazon Prime have removed specific episodes in response to government demands. For instance, Netflix removed an episode of the show Patriot Act upon the request of the Saudi government due to the host's criticism of Mohammed bin Salman. Fourthly, national norms. Some consumers engage in piracy because it is accepted as a common practice and is not energetically discouraged by local governments. Lastly, open access supporters. Many suppliers and consumers believe that pirating content is a form of activism against corporations and governments. Digital piracy is resilient and unlikely to disappear. Digital piracy should be discouraged. However, it is unlikely that it is going to disappear given the nature of digital technology. Three primary factors ensure the resilience of the community. First, the ease of distributing and copying digital media. Piracy websites acquire content from mainstream media sources. While Google and YouTube have taken steps to combat piracy, through a simple Google search, users can still access content on illegal websites. Second, as quickly as authorities shut down a piracy website, Providers create a new one to meet consumer demand. Popular piracy websites like Pirate Bay have been removed multiple times, but quickly reappear after rebranding and re-uploading. And third, anonymity through virtual private networks. Virtual private networks or VPNs hide IP addresses, making it more difficult for law enforcement agencies 
to trace activity back to pirates. VPNs have aided piracy by increasing the security users and the pirates view when participating in illegal activities online. Digital media piracy is highly resilient and likely to persist in spite of law enforcement efforts. While digital piracy should be combated, piracy websites could be a valuable tool for messaging by civil society organizations precisely because they are resilient and popular. Civil society groups can use piracy websites to transmit messages to vulnerable and underserved populations in several ways. First, through advertisements. Groups can target their messages by pairing advertisements with movies and television shows that are likely to be watched by viewers with specific regional or demographic characteristics. Second, civil society groups like other businesses that advertise on piracy websites can pay to have pre-movie trailers added to streamed content. For example, an NGO could use a pre-movie trailer to heighten breast cancer awareness in countries where the topic is taboo. And third, cinematic filters. Media companies use cinematic filters in movie theaters to discourage recording. The filters contain messages invisible to the human eye in theaters, but visible on recordings. Messages usually consist of copyright warnings. However, groups can use this technology to transmit other types of messages or QR codes that direct viewers to websites. Information dissemination through piracy networks is an overlooked tool for civil society groups to communicate with vulnerable or marginalized audiences. Large numbers of young adults living in authoritarian societies with significant censorship frequent piracy websites. Piracy websites are highly resilient and unlikely to disappear. Until they do, these sites are a value, valuable channel through which civil society organizations can promote human rights, provide public service information, create spaces for dissent, and explore advocacy through entertainment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sonia. That was incredibly fascinating. Um, and I'm sure we're going to have some great questions rolling in in the, in the uh, Q&A function soon. So um, I look forward to, to hearing more about your ideas. Uh, our final panelist in this series is Celine Swanson, also class of 2022, who will present on the use of citizens assemblies to combat political polarization in the United States. Celine, let's take it home. Thank you, Caroline. And thank you to the whole Mad Scientist team for having us today. In the last six months, political polarization has come to a head in the United States, from protests outside polling places to a frontal assault on the US Capitol. Americans have been shocked by the recent intensity of partisan conflict in our country. But this isn't a new problem. Effective political polarization has been growing for years. Growing effective political polarization poses three main threats to the United States. First, Polarization empowers foreign disinformation. Foreign disinformation campaigns take advantage of the lack of social trust engendered by severe effective political polarization. Americans are more willing to believe fake news about their political opponents or messages that challenge opponents' claims, which they then amplify on social media. In this manner, successful disinformation campaigns create a vicious cycle of increasing polarization. Second, polarization threatens our democratic institutions. When partisans believe their enemies are evil, they're more willing to consider anti-democratic means of defeating them. Both Republicans and Democrats display something called democratic hypocrisy, meaning they support violations of democratic norms when it helps their party. And national party polling shows increased tolerance for political violence in the United States. Finally, polarization endangers the United States' ability to use its power to promote democracy, capitalism, and free trade around the world. Infighting and unrest within the United States limits the country's ability to respond quickly to global crises. In the absence of strong leadership from the United States, Washington should expect increasing Chinese dominance on the world stage. Effective polarization concerns social identity and the degree to which a partisan likes their own group and dislikes the other. In the United States, Democrats and Republicans increasingly dislike members of the opposing party. This graph, which uses data from the Pew Research Center, shows how partisans' ratings of how negatively they feel towards members of the opposite party have risen over the last two decades. Between 1994 and 2016, the percentage of partisans who felt very unfavorable toward the other party rose by about 37 percentage points. Not only do Americans dislike people from the opposing party, they actively avoid them. Party affiliation increasingly dictates Americans' choice of friends and partners. Between 1960 and 2008, there was a marked increase in the number of partisans 
who would report reported that they would feel displeased if their child married someone belonging to the opposite political party. Social distance is accelerating. By 2010, almost half of Republicans and a third of Democrats reported that they were somewhat or very unhappy with the idea of inter-party marriage. Partisans' unwillingness to come into contact with one another may also explain why they vastly overestimate their differences in identity, income, and ideology. Effective political polarization is now the most salient social cleavage in the United States. Americans consistently rate members of the opposing political party lower than members of different religions or races. Additionally, data shows that the United States is polarizing more quickly than other Western democracies and is beginning to more closely resemble developing democracies like Poland. Most of the current research on polarization has focused on the national level, but there's an important opportunity to combat effective polarization at the local level. Local governments should introduce deliberative democracy forms to bring partisans in their communities into contact with one another. Research has consistently shown that contact reduces prejudice and stereotyping between people of different races and ethnicities, sexualities, and abilities. Deliberative forms around the world have been shown to have an impact on effective political polarization. A deliberative poll conducted at the national level in fall 2020 saw ratings of partisans rise at an average of 13 points with the largest increases among the most polarized partisans. So why start at the local level? The introduction of local deliberative forums would reverse the nationalization of local politics, grounding discussions of local issues in fact, not identity, and giving neighbors of different political stripes the opportunity to see each other as partners facing a common set of problems. The model for cooperation created by these forums will set an example that extends beyond the boundaries of the towns they're held in. It's not only participants in the forum that may experience a change in their outlook. Researchers in Pittsburgh also observed increased understanding between experts from opposing sides who were tasked with creating a joint briefing document for the forum. Deliberative forums also may change the outlook of non-participating members of the community by providing an example of cross-partisan cooperation. People are likely to see the results of that local cooperation in their daily lives. Local deliberative forums promise to be a powerful weapon in the fight against effective polarization. Without the introduction of innovative measures like this one, the United States will become even more polarized and jeopardize its position at home and abroad. This initiative cannot be delayed, not only because of the growing threat of effective polarization, but also because geographic polarization is decreasing the number of politically divided towns where this kind of contact and deliberation is possible. This graphic shows the increasing number of counties with landslide elections in 2016 versus 1992. Local policymakers must act now to secure their community's futures. Thank you. Thank you so much, Celine. Uh, that was absolutely wonderful. And thank you so much to all three of our wonderful panelists. You know, I was impressed when I heard your project pitches at the beginning of the year, and I just continue to get more impressed as we go. So that was great. Um, we're going to start off now with the Q&A section, and we're going to circle back to uh, Lauren first. So uh, let's go. We've got a question from a, a fellow PIPS alum. So Lauren, do you know if China and Russia are beginning to explore similar programs and partnerships for re relocating excuse me, climate refugees? If so, what impacts could that have for US national security? If China gets these types of partnerships first, could they theoretically forcibly relocate unfavorable ethnic minorities like the Uyghurs under the guise of climate relocation? Well, thank you so much for that question. And I think it's a really important one to be talking about as we are talking about climate displacement and relocation and the treatment of vulnerable communities. Um, I'm not entirely sure if, they, if China or Russia are pursuing these types of partnerships. However, I have a hard time buying the argument that they would be using climate change as a precipice to forcibly relocate certain communities. Um, but more to what I'm proposing, the United Nations has put out a significant amount of literature that it is not a forced relocation, that it is in fact a voluntary process with incentives to move. And it, in the partnership format, you get the buy-in from the local communities to this end. So your communities who have a desire to move, not communities who are being told to move. 
And within that partnership framework, you also get um, what I propose is like the imparting of norms from the United States. As relocation assistance partnerships are a new concept, relocation becomes intrinsically tied with the ideas of the proper treatment of vulnerable communities, not discrimination, not ethnic cleansing, not you know cultural divides. You get you know a better a better view of what and how governments should be treating these populations. Thank you. That's an excellent answer. Um, in a similar vein, do you think tools like GIS and the sharing of the output, um, the results that are gained from this sort of analysis, could this be of value in encouraging collaboration between groups in US society like NGOs and the military? You know, Who do you see taking on this role um, and, and who is the uh, really the brunt of the burden gonna be on? Yes, absolutely. I do think that this technology is a way to bridge the more security communities with the international development and NGO communities, because while the military has a lot of these remote sensing GIS like capabilities, the climate change and conservation communities are the ones who are thinking about them in this context. So the marrying of those two groups really creates the best outcomes for everyone going forward and allows for the United States to position themselves as the leader on climate change, climate displacement, climate mitigation and adaptation. Um, however, I do think that NGOs and local partnerships already have the foundation with the local level partners to be the first ones to take the steps in these relocation assistance partnerships. And once those relationships are you know, founded, then the military can step in and say, how can we help? How, what data can we provide? And what satellite imagery can we provide in order to move this forward and create the most sustainable outcome in the future? Excellent, that's very encouraging. Um, I guess a final question for you, Lauren. Once areas for relocation are identified, how will the United States kind of guide migration? Since many of the origin locations for climate migration are governments with low capacity, you know, how are you gonna reach these people and guide them to where they need to be? Absolutely. Uh, that's a very, very important question. And I think, you know, it does come from that local community engagement. So once you are able to identify an environmentally suitable site, you can then move forward with the cultural suitability and the social suitability, language suitability, and then begin to facilitate that process and talk to the host communities and say, where are the best places for us to relocate these people? What's going to be you know, the best place to build a village to, you know, where are they gonna have access to roads and infrastructure? So by using the GIS, you can start having those conversations in a much more targeted way. And then once you have a very specific site you know, settled, then you're going to have to be talking with local contractors about building up that infrastructure or you know, local uh, housing associations and you know, the government. And how can we ensure that these people have a right to these lands and you know, have full legal capacity to be operating in these zones? So it will be a difficult challenge, especially in these low capacity nations, but that's why the United States role is so important and so imperative because they can guide that process and ensure that everything is ethical and done you know, to proper American standards throughout the whole way. Thank you so much. That's a very nuanced answer. And, and I'm sure um, this is going to be really interesting as we move forward, especially uh, in, you know, kind of the Army's approach to dealing with with climate change, which is something that the mad scientist has been uh, been focusing on a lot recently. Uh, so we're now going to uh, pivot to Sonia. Um, so first question for you. Do you think that there are negative repercussions for the US government to use piracy networks? And if so, is this a approach left best for non-state actors? Thank you for that question. I think if governments um, like the US government are interested in using piracy networks for messaging opportunities, there's definitely ways for them to do it without actively interacting with pirates themselves. Uh, I think I think of three different ways to do it. The first would be through engagement with advertising networks. So they could engage with um, advertising networks like Google AdSense itself um, and kind of distribute to piracy, net piracy websites through these networks. I think the second way um, is actually cinematic filters. So they were developed as a way of counteracting piracy in the first place because they wanted to dissuade people from recording in cinema, uh, cinema houses. So I think the way for that to kind of translate onto a piracy website would actually be a, a promoted method by the industry itself because they want to see anti-piracy methods. And in addition to sort of creating an anti-piracy 
uh, mechanism, you're also spreading a message for vulnerable communities. So it's a two for one kind of deal with that one. I think the last thing is that we can actually on privacy websites do discrete advertising. The reason for this is that oftentimes when companies are selling products, they need their name to be attached to it. But in this instance, we're selling ideas instead, right? We're trying to create awareness. We're trying to rope in more communities so that we can spread ideas that are important to them, things like breast cancer awareness. I think you don't necessarily need a company's name uh, to be attached to that or a government's name or an NGO's name even. Um, so it is definitely possible to do discrete advertising in this area if governments are interested in that I do, however, think that the recommendations are more tailored to civil society organizations. And that's more because they're just aware of the on ground issues um, in the regions that they're working in. So they know exactly what to target uh, to communities that are affected. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, kind of pivoting to those uh, NGOs and human rights groups that you were talking about. Um, why should they kind of take on the risk of potentially damaging public image, you know, in, in terms of engaging with piracy, which is, you know, obviously illegal. Um, why should they kind of take on that risk of damaging their public image? Um, you know, will they face legal challenges? Like what is that operationally gonna look like for them? Definitely. I think some of the mechanisms that I mentioned um, for governments to use also sort of cross apply to civil society organizations. I think I would add that civil society organizations uniquely want to do this because they are doing this in countries where censorship has meant that they fail to reach the audiences they're trying to reach through other kinds of platforms. So if in a country, uh, Facebook is banned and Twitter is banned and all of the regular social, social media platforms that you would engage with these audiences with alternatively are banned, then their only sort of resort is piracy networks because they've proven to be resilient. That's the second thing I would highlight, that they've proven to be resilient. So messaging on these platforms would kind of be long-term, would be sustainable, would be something that they can sort of rebrand and re-upload as needed. The last thing I would highlight here is that I think the advocacy in this case is going to be very engaging because the way that the recommendation works is that the advocacy is linked to a lot of the titles, shows, and movies um, that individual users are watching. So if I am going to watch a movie that's about the LGBTQ plus experience in India, then I'm shown an ad about, you know, where safe houses are for members of that community if they're being discriminated against. Then I think the message of the civil society organization becomes all the more resilient. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, gonna wrap up with one last question for you, Sonia. Um, you mentioned in your presentation kind of a whack-a-mole problem in terms of you know, piracy websites being up and then taken down by governments, et cetera, when, they, when they're found. Um, so does this problem you described mean that organizations are gonna need to consistently seek out new websites and could that be prohibitively costly for them, you know, to take the time to, to con continuously re-advertise what they're trying to get across to the, to the public? Definitely. While I think there is sort of a whack-a-mole problem with websites that might be ranked in the 500s or 400s, the top 10 websites or the top 20 websites seem to be staying on top of the charts for a number of years. Um, so a bunch of websites have remained in the top 10 for over three or four years, which is a, a good amount of time for civil society organizations to at the very least start the conversation um, and create spaces for dissent in countries where none exists or countries where the government is working very hard to make sure that they're you know, being authoritarian, being successful in their authoritarian aims. I think the other thing um, that's important here is that while there is a whack-a-mole problem, because we have things like virtual private networks, we're able to kind of work around regional locks. Um, so while a, a country could have sort of created a, a backup where, you know, they shut down a website in one region, because of virtual private networks, we're able to access that website in a different country. Um, which means that users continue to have access to these contents um, and continue to have access to a lot of media that they are looking for. Thank you so much. And I, uh, I apologize, but we actually just had one more question roll in for you. So I'm gonna ask you one last one. Um, does using piracy networks align kind of with US moral, legal and ethical standards? This is a big question for you. Um, or is this kind of, a, kind of a seeking an end that's justified or a, does the end justify the means? I think sort of the important thing uh, to consider here is that the problem 
with piracy networks is that they're like any other platform, right? They are a platform that if good actors don't use, then bad actors will and already are using. So we've seen a lot of, you know, Russian uh, sort of bots working on these piracy websites. We've seen things like deep fakes becoming more common on these websites. We've seen a lot of things like betting ads. And it would be much more useful and much more sort of profitable, both through the lens of the US moral character and also in terms of local communities and what would be helpful for them for the advocacy on these kinds of sites to be something um, that is you know, about public health messages or is about creating dissent in countries where the government is uh, particularly oppressive. You've sold me. Um, perfect response. Uh, we're gonna move on to our last and final panelist. So Celine, our first question for you is what role do you think social media plays in increased political polarization? Um, and should the various platforms be more regulated? I think my answer to the question of what role does it play is yes. Uh, anyone who has had the pleasure of interacting with a family member on Facebook, I think would agree with me. Um, so I think there are three main problems associated with social media. And I actually see deliberative forms as kind of the opposite of that and remedying those problems. So the first problem is that it's impersonal. It's a lot easier to say something mean through a keyboard than to someone's face. And so deliberative forms bring these people face to face into contact with one another. And when they look like your grandma or they look like your sister, it's a lot harder to say some really nasty scathing things. Second, I think social media is designed to spread outrage. And these things get, that get lots of likes or lots of little angry reacts are the ones that go to the top of the algorithm. Um, whereas deliberative forums have facilitators who are there to encourage, uh, encourage civility. Um, and then thirdly, there's obviously filter bubbles on social media. So they want you to stay engaged. So they're gonna keep showing you what you wanna see. Uh, deliberative forums don't have that problem. They're bringing people in with different opinions and you're gonna hear those opinions. Um, so I see the deliberative forum as kind of the antithesis to these problems we have on social media. But I, at the same time, certainly I think increased regulation should be explored uh, for social media sites. That was an excellent response. And, and I agree about uh, engagement on Facebook. It can be, can be a struggle sometimes. Um, second question for you, how do you plan to incentivize people to join and participate in these forums? Um, and kind of a supplementary question to that, is consistent participation by individuals important or is limited participation still valuable? You know, if they can't go once a week, is, one, is once a month still valuable? And, um, you know, how would you respond to that? Thank you so much. Yes, well, I think participation is a really interesting problem and question with deliberative forums. In the uh, research phase of my project, I had the opportunity to speak with the city councilman here in Williamsburg. And one of the concerns he brought up was getting participation and participants outside of the usual cast of characters who's already highly engaged. And so I think we can address uh, participation issues in two ways. So first, we need to make it as accessible as possible to people. So they had a citizens assembly in Ireland and what they found is that they just couldn't retain participants who were female between the ages of 20 and 40. And that's because these women had childcare duties that were preventing them from attending these meetings. So things like providing childcare to participants can be a really good way to make it accessible. Another thing is providing accommodations for people with disabilities. So these assemblies are accessible to them as well. And then the second way that we can encourage participation is through compensation. So I get, you might be like, why are we gonna pay these people for doing their civic duty? Um, but it's not as wild an idea as you might think. We pay people who are on juries, we pay people who are poll workers. And I think the work you do on a deliberative forum is at least as important, if not more. Um, and then as far as your question about uh, intermittent engagement, I think any level of contact is good. Um, I think the more, the more important question is how frequently is a community using these sorts of forums? So one deliberative forum is good. A yearly deliberative forum, uh, putting this into the culture of a community, that's even better. 
That's a great response. I, I really like your your approach to kind of having these as a regular thing, you know, because it is it is not only about solving political problems, it's also about building community. So um, that was an excellent response. Uh, similarly uh, to that, your proposal focuses on implementing these forums at a local level, you know, at the community level. Um, and so will these forums still be as useful in areas where um, there's kind of already significant consensus among people who live there? Um, you know, if, if it's a dominantly blue or a dominantly red area, like how can this um, still be as useful to those communities? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, I think you bring up a good point. I think the place we need to start with these are divided communities where the significant division exists. One of my favorite examples of a deliberative forum that was really successful uh, comes from Northern Ireland. They brought together Protestant and Catholic parents of school children to discuss the future of local schools in that area. And what they found was at the end of that deliberative poll, these folks were more willing to consider policies that uh, would entail greater religious mixing in schools. And they also saw people on the other side of the religious divide as more trustworthy um, and more reasonable. So I think these forums have great potential for these divided communities. Um, but at the same time, I don't think they're completely useless in um, communities where there is more consensus because no community is homogenous. Um, at the end of the day, there is going to be some difference of opinion, and these forms can uh, provide a valuable opportunity for people to be exposed to that. Thank you so much. I have one last question for you, Celine. How will you ensure that policymakers implement what's recommended by citizens' assemblies? You know, people are going to be less likely to participate if they don't feel like it, it matters in the long run. So, how are you going to make sure that that happens? Absolutely. That's such an important question because you're right in that that's another important part about incentivizing people to participate. Um, so I think the important thing to remember about these deliberative forms is that they should be coming from the ground up. They're not being imposed from the state or the national level. This is being started by activists in the community and local government makers. And these policymakers should be included from the very beginning and they should be part of choosing the question um, that this deliberative forum uh, will consider. So if you can get buy-in at the beginning rather than coming up with recommendations and then asking the policymakers to buy in and implement those changes, uh, I think that's a really strong uh, way to get actual results. Uh, additionally, I think really great coverage on the local level of the forum will put increased pressure on these local policymakers to at least consider the ideas from the forum. That's a phenomenal response. I know uh, if if that was something that was an option in my community, I would absolutely go. So I'm I'm uh, so happy to have discussed it with you today. Um, and thank you to all three of our wonderful panelists. We have loved having you here. Mad Scientist is a big fan of PIPs. So uh, thank you all for attending. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to Matt for concluding remarks. Thank you, Caroline. Um, folks, the PIPs are batting a thousand. I mean, that's six for six with six home runs today. Those fantastic presentations, um, you know, they're looking at things that sometimes we're looking at in the army, but we're not looking at it from that angle. And other times they're looking at things that we haven't even thought about. Uh, you know, we use GIS a lot, but are we thinking about using GIS in this way? I don't know anybody in the army, at least from my perspective, who's talking about using digital piracy networks. That's a brand new thing to us. and That's fantastic. Um, and these deliberative forums, it's such a great idea that I don't know that we've even, you know, come around to that way of thinking. So that's the real value when we reach out beyond the army and we start talking to these young people and we get their perspective because they're thinking about things in ways that we're just not thinking about. So as we wrap up today, I want to say thanks to everybody who attended. Uh, this was a fantastic session, amazing presentations from, from, you know, future thinkers and really future leaders of this country. Um, I want to thank every one of the presenters on both panels. Uh, and the PIPS program overall, we have such a great partnership with them. We're always learning from them. We're glad they're just an arm's, arm's reach away. Um, and I wanna remind everyone that this session was recorded. So in the next couple of days, we'll have a link to the video and the chat. Um, so you can relive everything that we did here today. You can mine it for information. You can get all the links that we sent out through that chat. I'd also like to encourage everyone to sign up for our next event on May 6th, the Young Minds on Competition and Conflict. We're gonna, we're gonna invite 
uh, some of the younger officers in the Army to kind of talk about uh, their experiences, their perceptions, their perspectives uh, on competition and conflict. Uh, so you can find a link to sign up for that. I'm sure there's one in the chat now, possibly. And also, if you go to the blog, madsideblog.tradoc.army.mil, there's a link to that uh, on the sidebar. Uh, so we hope to see everyone for that one. I want to thank our moderators, Luke Shabro, Caroline Duckworth. You guys did a great job today. And once again, to all the presenters, and thank you for attending. So we'll see you next time. Thank you.